Kim Jong-un says it doesn't really matter because the United States, in fact, has not imposed any cost on North Korea that they can't bear. And the other thing is that they're probably looking at Moscow and Beijing and thinking that the Chinese and the Russians very well may have their back. Also, he knows that Xi Jinping, the Chinese ruler, is in the run up to the 19th Communist Party Congress. He's preoccupied about consolidating his power. So it's unlikely that Xi Jinping is actually going to pay too much attention to Kim, except we know that Xi will support the North Koreans in the Security Council as they're already doing at this very moment. Well, in, in a sense, might Kim Jong un be correct that the Russians and the Chinese have his back as much in the sense that it kind of occupies the United States uh, from either taking on China as it comes to trade or taking on Russia as it comes to uh, their adventures uh, in the former uh, Soviet bloc? Oh, yeah. I mean, the Chinese actually like this dynamic, at least on the short term, because they know that every time that North Korea does something provocative, we believe that we need Beijing's help. We send a high envoy to China and we stop talking about those things that are important to us, like South China Sea, cyber attacks, predatory trade practices, you name it. Um, so, you know, Kim Jong Un has understood this dynamic. His father did. You know, they have developed this pattern of behavior and they know that the Chinese and the Russians either together or one by one will support North Korea against the United States and our friends and partners. This stru uh, struck me as particularly poignant because so often uh, people refer to Kim Jong-un as a madman or he's crazy. In a way, he's very calculating. This from General Bob Scales in the Wall Street Journal. This regime has been in power for almost 70 years and understands the value of the long game. Mr. Kim wants to play nuclear blackmail. It's evil, it's dangerous, it's potentially catastrophic, but it isn't unpredictable and in that sense are we looking at this too much from a Western standpoint of what Kim wants is regime survival and to ensure regime survival rather than what Kim says he wants which is to reunify the Korean Peninsula with force you know, that's an excellent point, Leland, because, you know, as you say, we look at this and say, well, why do we want our nukes? Well, we want them for deterrence. We're not going to use them in an offensive capability. But Kim Jong-un, we've got to remember that the core goal of his regime is the destruction of the South Korean state. And I'm concerned that when Kim becomes confident in his arsenal, he's going to blackmail the United States to break our mutual defense treaty with South Korea and get our 28,500 service men and women off the peninsula so that he can then take over South Korea. That's when he miscalculates. That's when this mm. gets extremely dangerous. And a lot of Western analysts don't see it that way. You know, the Kims tell us exactly what they want to do, and we're just oblivious to this. Well, you know, I was going to follow up and ask you uh, what my dad asked me yesterday, which is, should we be worried? But uh, after that answer, I think we can uh, skip the answer and just go with yes. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thanks, Leland. All right. Good to see you. Heather? Well, meanwhile, the White House warning that any more threats from the rogue regime to the U.S. or its allies will be met with, quote, overwhelming force. The administration has not announced a specific plan for handling North Korea, but has repeatedly said that all options are on the table. Now, we heard the same thing from Nikki Haley just a couple of minutes ago at the U.N. Meantime, President Trump tweeted yesterday the United States is considering, in addition to other options, stopping all trade with any country doing business with North Korea. Our man on the North Lawn. Kevin Cork live at the White House. Uh, Kevin, have you seen anybody head in today? Uh, either Secretary of State Tillerson, SecDef Mattis, H.R. McMaster, the National Security Advisor? Yeah, you've been over here plenty of times. You know how it works. We're keeping our eye, not just on the West Exec here, but obviously uh, the, the walkway. But so far, not yet. But clearly, this is a circumstance, Leland, where the administration is speaking with one voice, and that is simply this. The time for talk is apparently over. And I say apparently because, as you heard from Nikki Haley, it is clear that the United States is pushing not only the United Nations, but in particular China. As you point out with that tweet, they're saying, listen, if you all won't act, we are not afraid to act unilaterally, though that could have catastrophic uh, consequences. Uh, the president tweeting today, South Korea is finding, as I've told them, that their talk of appeasement with North Korea will not work. They only understand one thing. This is, by the way, all happening in a morning where the president has actually had a conversation with his South Korean counterpart speaking by telephone. Now, all this is coming after the North, as you well know, has been conducting these various tests. We're up to six now, Leland. That's a big number. Six nuclear tests. 
the latest on Sunday, an underground blast so strong it registered a 5.7 on the Richter scale. And as you heard earlier on Fox News today, U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley said in no uncertain terms, time for talk is over. To the members of the Security Council, I must say enough is enough. When a rogue regime has a nuclear weapon and an ICBM pointed at you, you do not take steps to lower your guard. No one would do that. We certainly won't. The time has come to exhaust all diplomatic means to end this crisis. And that means quickly enacting the strongest possible measures here in the UN Security Council. Only the strongest sanctions will enable us to resolve this problem through diplomacy. We have kicked the can down the road long enough. There is no more road left. Wow, no more road left. Now, you heard what the president said on Twitter about possibly ending trade with those who continue to do business with North Korea. That wasn't exactly veiled. That was pointed directly at China. Here's what their foreign ministry spokesman is saying today. What is definitely unacceptable to us is that on the one hand, we worked so hard to peacefully resolve this issue. And on the other hand, our interests are subject to sanctions and jeopardized. This is unfair. Uh, the U.S. and China, by the way, are massive trade partners. We all know this, but the numbers, I think, uh, bear repeating. Uh, we're talking about in 2016, trade between the two countries was worth nearly $650 billion. It is clear that it's not just in China's economic interest, it's also in the region's interest that they do something to stop Pyongyang. Whether or not they act to do that is still anyone's guess. Leland? Oh, yeah. Now the Chinese are floating this freeze proposal at the U.N., yeah. uh, Haley describing it as, quote, insulting. Uh, Kevin, back to you. If anything else comes out from the White House in the next couple of hours, thank you. You got it. Heather. But in the meantime, with more on the president's response to North Korea, let's bring in Stephen Nelson. He's White House reporter for The Washington Examiner. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So a lot of breaking developments on this story, but let's begin with President Trump and a series of tweets where he did talk about halting all trade with countries doing business uh, with North Korea, also faulted South Korea for what he called talk of appeasement. Is he moving in the right direction? Is he taking the correct steps? Well, he sent the tweet about cutting off uh, all trade with countries doing business with North Korea shortly after saying, uh, we'll see about attacking the North. Uh, neither option seems incredibly plausible, and what appears to be uh, emerging as a more likely step is secondary sanctions on companies that are uh, outside of North Korea and doing business with the country. But for what, how, at least what, the past three administrations, we've had this issues, we've tried sanctions before. How do we know that they will work this time around? What do we need to do differently? Right. I mean, this is a question that people have thought about since uh, 2006 when North Korea launched or had its first nuclear weapon test. And if there was an easy answer, it would have been arrived to by now. So that's what policymakers have to think about and consider. How can we enact tougher sanctions when there have been five previous rounds of attempting to stop North Korea from doing this? Mm -hmm. We heard Kevin Cork speaking there. Uh, he said, you know, this administration seems to be speaking with one voice. How important is that? Uh well, of course, the administration is taking perhaps a, a different approach than previous ones. President Trump has made very clear that he views strength as a way to uh, coerce North Korea's compliance. And Secretary of Defense Mattis uh, made that clear yesterday, saying that the United States possessed the ability to destroy North Korea if necessary. And so th that the message is clear. Uh, it's There are no mixed messages mm -hmm. from the Trump administration. What about when it comes to targeting other countries? countries, uh, specifically uh, dealing with Russia and how they impact um, trade with North Korea? Well, of course, that's under consideration. But uh, again, we have to get back to the fact that this has been a long running problem and uh, taking measures that haven't been taken so far. Uh, that's, a, that's a difficult question. And how do we still manage to be on good terms with South Korea while at the same time, as we began the conversation, talking about um, their role in terms of appeasement and that not working? Right. Well, President Trump, of course, was 
criticized for that tweet. And a likely response probably is going to be the increased deployment of uh, anti-missile technology to South Korea and a show of uh, yeah, continued U.S. support. Uh, so so that, that, of course, is a mm -hmm. likely response as well. Yeah, I don't know if you heard uh, Nikki Haley uh, just within the past hour. She uh, began her comments on North Korea saying that for 20 years, the Security Council has taken actions against North Korea's nuclear program. And for more than 20 years, North Korea has defied their collective voice. So what will it take for them to listen? Uh, if there was an easy answer, it would have been arrived to by now. Okay. Thank you very much for joining us, uh, Stephen Nelson. We appreciate it. Thank you. We'll continue to watch the U.N. and the White House amid now new growing concerns about a gas shortage after Hurricane Harvey. Get this, two-thirds of U.S. refining capacity on the Gulf Coast in Texas and Louisiana. Much of that has been shut down. We're going to show you how the storm is impacting prices at the pump across the country. Plus, the cleanup already starting for Harvey and the, get this, the hidden deadly dangers that those floodwaters have left behind. Across America this holiday weekend, everyone is paying more at the pump, and in many places, gas supplies are tight. Hurricane Harvey shut down nearly 20% of U.S. refining capacity. Prices at the pump already up double digits near two years' highs across much of America. And fears of a shortage have caused long lines, as you can see, at gas stations in Texas right now. Some refiners and distributors are coming back online from the Chicago Mercantile Exchange on Friday, gas futures began to fall just a little bit. Oklahoma Congressman Mark Wayne Mullen of Oklahoma is a member of the Energy and Commerce Committee, joins us now. Nice to see you, sir. Appreciate it. Good to see you. Thanks for having me on. So are we out of the crisis mode, at least as it relates to gas supply and gas prices? You know, I was on the phone with a lot of people yesterday. Uh, they're confident that uh, the supplies are coming back up. They said we never had a, a shortage. We just had a problem of delivering the product. So we saw the, re I mean, look, we lost 31% of our capacity to refine product here in the United States, the largest shutdown ever in U.S. history. Uh, so, of course, there was a lot of knee-jerk reaction. The pumps prices went up around 20%, but everything seems to be moving in the right direction right now. You saw the, uh, you saw the, that um, uh, the refineries are coming back online today. And so we feel like there's there's more of a panic out there than there really is a need. I'd hope people would just kind of take a deep breath, let the, let the system work, and we'll be back on uh, full capacity before long. We've heard the president talk about wanting to put America on a path, not to energy independence, but energy dominance. Does this right. show a weakness uh, in that path? No, I think what it shows is that we need to diversify the areas to which uh, we are refining products. Uh, for so long, the permitting process to open a refinery has been very uh, tedious and in some cases outright impossible. Uh, a lot of refineries are, are extremely aged now. Uh, this we should show uh, the, the need to diversify the areas to which we refine them. Hopefully we can get these permits up and going and get new, uh, new refineries built in different where, where, areas. Where are we talking about for new refineries? Well, I mean, you, you could look right here in Oklahoma, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's where it has to be. Where's the product being produced? You've got product being produced in the Dakotas. Uh, you can go farther up north, farther inland. Uh, it, but a lot of times our piping system that we have that we're delivering the product goes to one central area. And of course, that's been in Houston. So uh, what we've been talking about is how can we diversify the areas? How can we help the EPA get these permits approved? How can we encourage the refineries and the companies that do the products, how can we encourage them to, to diversify the areas to which they're being delivered to? So that's the direction we're going. What lessons can we learn? We're learning lessons to make sure that this doesn't happen again. All right. Well, uh, as that works its way through Congress, and if there's any new refineries, come back and talk to them about us, sir. Oh, we would love to, and I appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to get this news out to, to, uh, to all the individuals out there. All right. Great being with you. Uh, congrats hey, on a good uh, football weekend in Oklahoma. That's right, <laughs> always. We root for both, Oklahoma State and OU, but if they're both playing, I'm Oklahoma State. All right, well, the Cowboys did well. Appreciate it, sir. All the best.
Yes, sir. Thank right. you. Heather? Well, a little more about Harvey. Uh, Houston's mayor expressing optimism in the face of billions of dollars in damage. Can America's fourth largest city function while recovering from Harvey? A Houston resident helping with recovery efforts joins us ahead. Plus, people from across the country responding to the need for donations to help Harvey victims. How Americans are coming together to do just that. Up next. I connected with a group of moms and we've been going door to door picking up donations. They will need help for years to come and um, we're just doing our part. Right now, Colorado's Republican Party stepping up to help Harvey flood victims in Texas. A truck filled with thousands of dollars worth of donations took a 1,000 mile journey from Denver to Houston to help survivors in shelters. The Colorado GOP says Democrats and Libertarians joined in their effort as well. The Red Cross reports about 37,000 families are still staying in shelters all across Texas. Heather? Well, the Harvey relief efforts also coming from volunteers all across the country and joining storm survivors in Texas clean up now in high gear with some areas still underwater. But despite the long road to recovery, Houston's mayor says the city is open for business. And joining us now is Summer Hull. She is a Houston resident helping with recovery efforts, who is also a travel blogger. First of all, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, begin with telling us personally what you have experienced there. Um, I've experienced both seeing intense devastation. I mean, feet and feet of water that have knocked down brick walls of homes and thousands of homes. Um, and I've also seen a community just immediately rally person to person before big groups could even really get involved to, to make this better, to get us back on track. Yeah, we heard Leland just talking about at least, what, 37,000 families still living in shelters. Uh, were you displaced at all? What did you have to deal with? Personally, we were super lucky. We don't live where it flooded. Um, we did have some ceilings collapse, so we've got some rooms with holes, but you know, our house is livable, so we were luckily in a position where we could help others instead of having to worry too much about us right now. Yeah, you seem so positive, and, and that feeling of, of positivity we've seen um, from just person after person, they're helping in, in Texas, you know, neighbor helping neighbor. Uh, how important is that in terms of long term? Oh, you know, we live here and, you know, our story is by no means unique. You're right. I have seen so many people so positive, even those who've lost their houses. Um, they're doing everything they can, both for themselves and others. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's how we started day one here. And that's how we'll be long after, yeah. you know, the national attention turns to the next thing. Yeah. What is the greatest need that you are seeing right now? The greatest need right now changes minute to minute. And yeah. that's why I think that those people on the ground are the ones to help the most. You know, I'm seeing things for Gatorade, masks, gloves, um, dog crates, things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, not the clothes and the stuffed animals, but the things people need to put on themselves like today. Yeah. When you see organizations or really individuals who have been raising so much money to help with these relief efforts, does it concern you that, that it won't go to the places where it's most needed and it won't go directly to the people who can use it? You know, I'm sure that most groups do their very best and they'll do great and they'll help with those huge needs. Uh, but that's why there's that balance of mm -hmm. those of us who live here who are able to, to meet those exact needs we see, you know, and work hand in hand with those big groups that just, they have, yeah. you know, a lot of stuff they need to handle. It really is remarkable. Um, you've used the internet as so many other people have through this disaster to reach out to people, to uh, connect people with others who can help them. Uh, tell us a little bit about your Facebook book posting. So that's been really cool. Um, and again, I know my story's not unique here, but we just started sharing what we were doing. Mm -hmm. And our friends around the world who are connected thanks to Facebook saw it and wanted to send us money to keep us doing more just because we're in the right place at the right time here. And so I've had friends literally as far away as New Zealand just PayPal us money so we can keep um, helping and keep sharing the needs that we're spotting. And Facebook has been just tremendous with getting really specific needs met really, yeah. really quickly. It was amazing to watch it unfold even as Harvey hit where people in yeah. other parts of the country were posting on Facebook or Twitter trying to find their loved ones or trying to get help to them in their time of need. So the social media definitely used for a positive thing in this. 
Oh, absolutely. It's not just save lives, but now it's really helping lives get back on track with specific needs, specific sizes, specific everything. Mm -hmm. um, it's been so helpful and it will keep being so helpful. You know, Summer, thank you so much. And our prayers with you and, and everyone there in Texas. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for your support. Yeah. Well, Fox News, meantime, has been telling you uh, how to help via the Red Cross. But Summer, uh, as you just heard, she says there are actually several local charities that could also use some help right now, including the East Texas Dream Center. She also says that the River Plantation Command Center has been very helpful. And to help take care of local pets, you can go to OperationPetsAlive.org. Also, the Montgomery County Animal Shelter needs some help. So pitch in if you can. For sure. And so many of our viewers have. We thank you. For for that. Meantime, here on this Labor Day, we are following breaking developments in the North Korea nuclear showdown. The UN Security Council now holding an emergency meeting and hearing some tough talk from U.S. Ambassador Nikki Haley. So will it be enough for the Security Council to act? live to the U.N. in a minute. Plus, the president about to make a major announcement on the program that protects illegal immigrants brought to this country as children and the opportunity he's expected to give Congress when it comes to the so-called dreamers. Our political panel on what this means come November. Well, the Fox News alert, the U.N. Security Council just wrapping an emergency meeting on the North Korea nuclear crisis and our ambassador to the U.N., Nikki Haley, making the case for taking a tough stand, saying Kim Jong-un is, quote, begging for war. Despite our efforts over the past 24 years, the North Korean nuclear program is more advanced and more dangerous than ever. They now fire missiles over Japanese airspace. They now have ICBM capabilities. They now claim to have tested a hydrogen bomb. And just this morning, there are reports that the regime is preparing for yet another ICBM launch. To the members of the Security Council, I must say, enough is enough. Brian Yenis is live for us at the United Nations with more. Brian? Hi, Heather. Well, look, the U.S. Ambassador Nikki Haley saying just moments ago that North Korea has slapped everyone in the face on that Security Council, all 15 nations. She says that this week they will negotiate a new Security Council resolution that they hope to vote for on Monday. She said that the time is over for half measures and that she expects and wants the strongest measures ever enacted against North Korea. She noted that the Security Council has kicked this can down the road for long Long enough. Now, she began her remarks listing time after time over the last 24 years that she says the international community has tried and failed to talk to North Korea. And now she said that all options are on the table for the United States. His abusive use of missiles and his nuclear threats show that he is begging for war. War is never something the United States wants. We don't want it now. But our country's patience is not unlimited. Now, both Russia and China have, have both condemned uh, North Korea's recent nuclear tests. But all, Russia has called for an urgent need for all sides to keep a cool head, saying that history has shown that these Security Council sanctions have not worked. So they want an immediate return to dialogue and negotiations. Well, China called the situation a, quote, vicious cycle and called for the U.S. to adopt a plan they call freeze for freeze. They want the United States to stop military games with South Korea and to remove THAAD defense missiles in return for North Korea stopping their missile uh, tests. And uh, real U.S. Ambassador Nikki Haley says that's not going to happen. Freeze for freeze is insulting. When a rogue regime has a nuclear weapon and an ICBM pointed at you, you do not take steps to lower your guard. The United States will look at every country that does business with North Korea as a country that is giving aid to their reckless and dangerous nuclear intentions. And what we do on North Korea will have a real impact on how other outlaw nations who seek nuclear weapons choose to conduct themselves in the future. The stakes could not be higher. 
The United States making it clear through the Secretary of uh, the Treasury, uh, Steve Mnuchin, that they are willing to act unilater unilaterally, unilaterally to make sure they adopt sanctions and really stop all trade with countries who are doing trade with North Korea. Remember, China is 90 percent of the trade with North Korea. So we shall see whether the United States will act unilaterally. But Nikki Haley with a strong message today at the U.N. Heather. And will China follow through and will they be held accountable if they do not? Uh, Brian Yenis live for us. Thank you, Brian. A lot of news on the domestic front as well. Just in, Fox News confirming that President Trump will take action tomorrow on the Obama-era program known as DACA, which protects young immigrants who were brought into this country illegally as children. The commander-in-chief expected to end the program, but with a six-month delay in implementing his decision. That would give Congress time to step in and protect the 800,000 so-called DREAMers. In this country, joining us now, John Jordan, conservative commentator and former naval intelligence officer, and Capri Cafaro, executive in residence at the American University School of Public Affairs and former Ohio State Senate Minority Leader. Great to see you both. Thank you. Uh, John, uh, reasonable people could agree uh, that Congress has not exactly had uh, success lately in getting anything done. Is this just a way to kick the can down the road for the administration? No, I think this is step one in a three-part process that the administration um, is undertaking here as we go into the elections next year. First of all, DACA, by President Obama's own admission, is unconstitutional. It is an executive overreach. It's a separation of powers problem. President Trump is doing the right thing by delaying it by six months to give Congress time to act so no one is hurt, no one is harmed. That will effectively take away the argument by the left that President Trump is anti-immigrant when, in fact, all he really seeks to do is enforce existing immigration law within the bounds of the Constitution. So that's the first step. The second step is tax reform, because you've got to get upward pressure on wages before the midterm, and they got to get that done by Christmas of this year, roughly, in order for that to be politically efficacious, for it to wend its way through the economy. Third, next spring, what they need to do is roll out um, to the country where we will have um, some sort of amnesty path to legalization, maybe even a path to citizenship, for the 11 million people that are here illegally outside of DACA. And then at the same time you say there also has to be money for the wall there has to be money to enforce to close our borders um, polls show that even immigrants the immigrant community the ones that the Latinos that are here legally do support immigration do support the enforcement of our immigration laws okay so, so hold that, on. Make, we, need get, we need to get against. Capri in here uh, I'll, I'll let you choose one two or three what do you want to take issue with uh, you know, honestly, I think that uh, maybe the Trump administration needs to listen to this gentleman here. I mean, I think that he is right about a number of things here. Um, you know, while maybe I don't necessarily agree with uh, some of the campaign promises uh, of the Trump administration, and I, I am not a, a fan of his uh, repeal of DACA, I do agree that a six-month, uh, you know, delay in allowing um, the, the Congress to be able to take this up legislatively, to take away that constitutional issue, and make sure that we do protect these uh, 800,000 um, people that were frankly not brought here. They did not come on their own volition. They were minors. They were brought here from, you know, not under their own control. And now they don't know any other country but the United States of America. They have no, to be no, in no one's arguing. Okay, we, to, let, let, me, let me stop you there, Capri, because we all, we all understand who the dreamers are. And it is almost like a made uh, for TV or made for the front page <laughs> of the New York Times story. Uh, and it's already started. BuzzFeed uh, down during the hurricane found a pair Paramedic. Uh, the headline, right, this I paramedic who rescued Harvey victims may be deported right. if Trump ends DACA. And then they quoted him in between rescuing people and helping people who need dialysis, insulin or reach life saving medical machines. Contreras didn't have a lot of time to think about himself after hearing about the DACA decision, quoted him as saying it was like getting an extra kick to the face when you're already down. John, is this decision to send this to Congress, the Trump administration realizing they've got an optics problem when it comes to the dreamers? Well, they, they do have an optics problem. There's no doubt about that. No but at the same time, they do have a legal problem. DACA is unconstitutional, even by President Obama's own admission. So they got to clean that up. And it is within the properly within the purview of Congress to make this right and to basically to codify DACA legislatively. And then it's fine. And then we move on.
So, so Capri, Capri, is it in the Democrats' best interest? Uh, forget what the right thing to do is, because Congress doesn't always do what the right thing is. They can do it politically uh, expedient. Democrats in Congress, do they help Republicans on this? And do they help get to majorities in both the House and Senate where very conservative Republicans may not go along? Right. Or do they obstruct and allow the Republicans to fall flat on their face on this? I think that Democrats do need to step up. I mean, I've been saying this on a number of issues, including, uh, you know, the repeal and replace of, of the Affordable Care Act. We need to be part of the governing body. And we cannot just obstruct because people are, these are real human beings, and they count on government to be able to deliver. So I say Democrats need to work with Republicans on this to make sure that we do have a strong package to make sure that when they do codify DACA, it works. Mm. Um, because there are a number of people on the line, and frankly, um, as was uh, talked about a little bit earlier, I think that we do need to have comprehensive immigration reform, and Democrats need to step up with with a workable solution uh, for that as well. Well, if only it was the two of you doing it, it sounds like we might have a <laughs> chance at it. We'll see. We'll see if any folks in Washington share the same sentiments. Thanks. Let's Appreciate hope. you both being here. Thank you. All the best, Heather. My pleasure. Well, officials in Texas warning looters that they will be arrested and charged, but that's not stopping some of them, if you can believe it. Our next guest, a Texas resident, is doing something about it himself. And from one extreme to another, from Texas flooding to a California wildfire, it is the biggest in the history of Los Angeles County. As the flames rage just north of L.A., the governor now declaring a state of emergency. Welcome back to Happening Now. We have some new information for you on the Los Angeles area wildfire that the mayor says is the largest that that city has ever seen. Governor Jerry Brown declaring an emergency there. Uh, this is an evening time lapse video there that you're looking for. The flames moving through Latuna Canyon in the Vertigo Mountains. This is north of Los Angeles. The fire has apparently torched 7,000 acres, and that's roughly the area of nearly 7,000 football fields. Air crews dropped flame retardant over the fire. The L.A. Fire Department saying that it is now 30 percent contained. Four firefighters hurt, though, battling those flames. They are expected to be OK. Leland. Well, as we have been reporting, the devastation from Hurricane Harvey has brought out some of the very best in Texans and in Americans. We have seen people rescuing strangers stranded in their homes or cars, but we have also seen the worst in human nature. People taking advantage of the situation by looting. And you can see the signs that folks in Texas have put up. You loot, we will shoot. And some Texas residents are taking matters into their own hands to keep their friends safe. Seth Irwin from Brazoria County, Texas, joins us now on the phone. He and his neighbors have taken up arms to protect their community uh, that is surrounded by water. Seth, appreciate you being with us. Uh, take us through. We, we know some of your friends' uh, houses were broken into. So how does your guys' patrols try, try to prevent that? Yeah, Leland, uh, we have an outstanding group of fearless driven uh, residents, man. We've got, uh, we're guarding every dry entrance we have, which we only have about three. Uh, we're doing a, uh, we're doing rounds 24 7. We have uh, mobile patrols on foot and vehicle. We're running night vision binoculars and thermal cameras. Uh, everyone is well armed. Uh, a lot of the farms used have been purchased from Irwin's toy box. Uh, we're here to stop a threat. Uh, we're, we're not here to uh, kill anyone. We're here to stop a threat. You, have you found any looters yet, Seth, or uh, have the signs and uh, the guys in night vision and camo gear scared them off? Um, I have a feeling uh, this is not like hunting, hunting pigs. Uh, humans are very, very, uh, very smart, and uh, uh, I don't know. They may be hiding out where we can't see, but uh, we're, we're showing our presence, and, uh, and I have a feeling that uh, this is a big deterrent, the, the, the mass amount of people we have uh, helping out with security. Well, no kidding. It seems as though uh, you look, we're, we have some aerial pictures sort of of the, the neighborhoods that you're in. You guys are really pretty isolated on, a, on an island there. Uh, I'm struck uh, your, your community is not the only one that's doing this. Uh, and the Fort Bend Sheriff, Tony Nails, uh, in an interview with us over the weekend, he said uh, about looters, there's a possibility you could leave this county in a bag. Uh, it appears as though Texas has taken a, a zero tolerance view towards looting. 
what sort of is the mandate you have given your men and the guys you're with in terms of how you're going to try and prevent this? Are you driving around? Is it static posts? What's the order of the day? We have a few uh, few guys. Everybody's in teams of two. Uh, everybody's armed. Uh, we've got uh, three static posts, and we have uh, probably five to ten uh, mobile posts. So uh, I don't I don't think uh, I don't think anybody's going to get by us. Yeah, no, I, it, it doesn't sound like that. Real real quickly, Seth, uh, where are you guys in the cleanup process? Did you stay dry and are just sort of isolated, or at the same time are you protecting your homes while trying to muck them out? So, so we started this effort uh, on Tuesday, and uh, we've been watching water now. We've got all our uh, low spots on the levees, uh, on the levees uh, built up, and we're uh, pretty confident uh, that we're going to keep the water out right now. We're shifting our efforts to, uh, to uh, keeping everything secure, uh, keeping looters out, but we're still watching the water levels. Uh, we're we're holding, holding steady on east and west side. We're actually just uh, surrounded by water right now. Wow. Uh, we're in a fish. We're in a fish bowl, and we're staying dry. Well, pretty pretty incredible that you guys uh, protected your uh, community not only by building the levee, but now afterwards uh, from looters. Uh, Seth, uh, Godspeed to you and your men, and uh, looters beware. If you're anywhere near uh, Seth Irwin's neighborhood, I'd stay away. Thanks, Seth. Heather? Thank you, sir. Hopefully they will stay safe. Well, with cleanup underway from Hurricane Harvey, health concerns are growing. Uh, those floodwaters are full of sewage, all sorts of toxins. We'll talk with the doctor about the range of dangers left behind. The challenge in this storm, because of the incredible flooding that has occurred, is getting the resources to the individual. So the pharmaceutical supplies are available. It's making certain we get them to the individual. Fox News alert is there is new fallout here and really 